Lord, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, Lord, again, to gather um, together and to learn from your word. Lord, I was reminded this week, as you know, about the, the word ecclesia, which we translate church, which means the called out ones. You've called us out. Lord, you've called us out in so many different ways, but this is referring to calling us out from our homes to gather together to worship you. So here we are, together, worshiping our Savior. We pray, Father God, right now in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would just anoint your word, that you'd be uh, lifted up in every way. Lord, we want to glorify you. We, we thank you for communion and confessing that to you, our sins to you, and thanking how Jesus, how you did break the seal. Lord, that, Lord, that... <laughs> We ourselves were unworthy, but you were worthy. We praise you for that. And now, Lord, we ask that you to open up the word to us so we can clean what you want for our lives today. We thank you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But... Before the marriage could take place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son. And you're to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, Today's message is called The Grinch Who Steals Our Joy Through People Letting Us Down. Last uh, week, we began a series, a new Christmas message series, called The Grinch Who Steals Our Joy and How to Take It Back. Um, we've discussed that there, last week that there actually is a real, true Grinch. Interestingly enough, of course, it's a mythical character from our society's perspective, but the Bible teaches us that there really is a true Grinch, isn't there? Uh, and, and he's worse than anything the society can make this other Grinch out to be, right? This mythological creature. In reality, Satan, the devil, is a, is a true entity. And he, along with his, his demonic forces, live to make us miserable. Last week we talked about, we gave a little profile of what this Grinch is like. We looked at Revelation chapter 12. We also mentioned that he had certain tools in his toolbox. The Bible would call them schemes where he tries to do what he can uh, to make us unhappy or even hurt and maim us some way, even possibly destroy us if he could. He certainly doesn't want us to be joyful. That's the opposite of what he wants. He wants us to be defeated, miserable. He wants to do all he can to just to make us like we don't even want to live. That's how he operates. He gets his jollies, unfortunately, out of our misery. And last week we talked about how the enemy, the Grinch, the devil, can use negative circumstances to bring us down. Uh, And how his desire is, sometimes he he causes them, but a lot of times he just uses what happens. But he tries to use them to make us miserable, to take away our joy. We stated a principle that that Satan seeks my sadness, but God grants me gladness. And we talked about how we could discover joy even in the midst of challenging circumstances. Today we're going to be looking at another tool of this true Grinch, uh, the devil, that he uses to make us miserable, and that is how he, he uses people to let us down, and how that can make us miserable instead of joyful, if you know what I mean. It encourages us to be that way. So what we're going to do is we're talking about how the enemy can really use other people to let us down, to foster angst, or anger, frustration, or hurt on our part, all of which can lead to greater problems but how God will still wants to work in our lives and how he wants to instead, he wants to foster joy even during the times of adversity and discord among other people. God wants to help bring about joy in those kind of difficult circumstances. 
And then we'll, we'll look at, at uh, three to four tips, depending on how you look at it, on how God, if we follow his principles, can still help us have joy even in the midst of challenging times when people let us down. Have you ever felt let down during the Christmas times? For example, have you ever witnessed family drama when all your family and relatives got together for the holidays? <laughs> yeah, crazy, isn't it? Man, I do. I've seen that. I remember as a kid, boy, our, just my older aunts and uncles going at it at times, and my grandpa having to go at it with them, and it was like I just wanted to slink away. It's, it can be really challenging. To watch family members and relatives go at it. Have you, for example, in general, have you ever had other people not keep their promises with you? And as a result, leave you in a lurch? How did you respond? How do you tend to respond when that happens? Or perhaps you see how some of your loved ones, maybe you see how they turned out. And that grieves your heart. Because you care about them so much. Perhaps you see maybe your own kids or grandkids. And it hurts because you see maybe they're not embracing the faith that you tried to instill with them as they were growing up. Or at least not maybe share your values, what you see in Scripture, and that pains your heart. Those are tough things, aren't they? They are for me. The truth is, people issues can sometimes leave us hurting, and that can really steal our joy if we let it, can it? Honestly, sometimes we can, we, to be truthful, can be the source of pain for other people, can't we? Let's be honest, can't we? Even unintentionally, right? Sometimes we can cause other people angst and not even mean it, right? Can't we? Boy, I can't. I, I'm going to open up about it. something that happened. Oh, I'm, this, this, this is a true story. <laughs> the names will not be changed to protect the innocent. Because I'm not innocent because it's about me. All right, here it is. I remember when I was a kid, when I first learned about... I'm going to look around here. No kids in here, right? Okay, good. About the truth about Santa. <laughs> I remember, boy... I was eight years old, drive, I walking home with some boys, and they were talking, and they said, there's no real Santa. And I said, no, there is a Santa, there is a Santa. And I remember running home and talking to my mom. I said, mom, mom, these guys, boys, they said there's no Santa. And I know there's a Santa. She said, well, son, I got to tell you something. No! Oh, that rocked my world. <laughs> and it really did. Because years later, believe it or not, when I was in high school, junior and senior in high school, I started having doubts in my faith, and and I remember one of the thing, arguments I said to myself was, well, I was told there was a Santa and that was a lie. How do I not know people telling me there's a God and that's not a lie too? That affected me. And, and so, I mean, it affected me big time. Believe it or not, I went to counseling over it. I mean, not about the Santa part, but just about my doubts. <laughs> But I was so determined when, I, when Sherry and I had kids that we were not, I was not going to let them have a, to lose their faith in God because of a misunderstanding about this figure called Santa Claus. And so I was determined, to, but I also wanted them to have, enjoy the, the joy of the season. So I was determined to tell them the truth, that there really was a St. Nicholas. If you know the story, this is what we told them. We told them the truth. There was a St. Nicholas who was a long time ago. He's a really godly Christian man, and he wanted to honor the birth of Christ. And so he would give gifts to orphans, and he would put them in stockings when they were asleep. And it was really cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it's cool. He's in heaven now, but isn't that neat? I mean, I told, we told the truth. That's what we did. And it seemed like, yes, and they were still excited about Christmas. It was all good. I thought we did well until one day uh, um, our neighbor came up to us after uh, one afternoon late. She had taken our son, it was late fall, to her to take her and her son. Her son was a couple years older than our son. He was like, our son was like four or five at the time, so her son was six or seven. And I remember she came home because she was taking him to the tide pools. And... Uh, and then she said, uh, 
I need to tell you something. We said, what? She said, well, we were driving along, you know, and my son saw this big billboard sign of, of Santa Claus, and he said he was really excited about Christmas coming and seeing, having Santa come, and, and your son said, Santa's dead. <laughs> <laughs> no! Now, we never use that language, understand? We just said he's in heaven, but he was not stupid. He put it together. Oh, we wanted to sleep in the house that time, too. Sorry. What we intended to have to maintain the faith in the Lord and our son ended up causing some really unbelief towards Santa and their son, and they weren't happy about it. Anyway, so we, sometimes we can cause, unintentionally cause pain in other people, can't we? People challenges can leave us feeling pretty hurt at times. And sometimes if we're careful, they can rock our world. Or at least they can add fuel to the fire in an already horrendous situation. And the enemy, the Grinch, and that's who's behind a lot of our stuff. Remember, there's a true Grinch. He likes to use situations like these to cause us misery. All I can do is, I can just think about Job. And the, and the Bible describes the enemy, the true Grinch, in that story. If you don't know about Job, the devil asked God if he could devastate Job's life because Job was a righteous man and honored God fully. And that devil says, yeah, that's just because you, you bless him so much. Ah, you, you let me get a hold of him and I'll rock his world and he'll curse you to your, your face. You know, this kind of stuff. And God says, I don't know. He's going to be faithful. No, I know. He's, okay, you can do what you want. Just don't hurt him, his body or anything. So the devil went at it. I mean, he killed Job's kids. He used natural sources, like natural disasters. That was a windstorm. He, uh, he used people, marauders, to take away all of Joe's possessions and his material wealth because he was the richest person in the East at that point. He was like, one day he was like richest and then he was like the poorest. Just like that. And no kids. Really bad. And then... Job still, like God knew he would, was remaining faithful to God. So Job says, okay, let me out of his body. I'll hurt him and, and, and then he'll curse you. And God said, no, he won't. Yeah, he will. Okay, just don't kill him. So he was able, the devil then hurt him by giving him boils, really painful boils, from the top of his head down to the sole of his feet and everywhere in between. And he was in total pain. But still, Job didn't deny God. But let me tell you something. It really rocked Job's world. All he had to do was read the rest of these things. But you know what was worst? You know what the hardest part was? And this is where it gets onto our message today. If this was all bad, wasn't bad enough and it was worse, to hope, hopefully we would never have to experience all that Job went through, right? Maybe we've had microcosms of it. But what made it the worst, what was like salt in the wounds for Job, was his... Friends, quote unquote, friends, showed up to console Job and for seven days. They did it right. They didn't say a word. They're good. Keep it that way. But then they opened their mouths. And they proceeded to try and to blame Job for his own circumstances. You're at, you're at fault. You're a psych that's sinner. And the more Job says, no, I don't, I don't think that's it. No, you are, you are. And then the more they did, they would just, they would kept raising the level. You could read, you could read the level of their anger and read the level, the intensity of their voices just by reading the pages of the dialogue. You're the terrible sinner. Forsake your sin and everything will be brought back to you. I mean, it got really bad. Friends. Call kicking you when you're down. Amen? And the enemy uses people to do that, doesn't he? He doesn't want to... There's no free space with, with the devil. He hasn't... Like, oh, okay, you say, uncle, I can't have enough, devil. I've had enough. I won't fight you right now. So, good, I'm not going to kill you. That's all he is. 
He doesn't lay up. He wants you totally miserable. And yes, he will even destroy you if he could. It was God who defended Job. He didn't let the devil destroy him. Here, the truth is, well, you see, while people can leave me hurting, God is reassuring. Let me say that again. While people can leave me hurting, God is reassuring. I can, can you all say that a lot? We got, it seems too quiet in here. All right, here we go. Count of three, let's say it together. Count of three together. One, two, three. While people can leave me hurting, God is reassuring. This, I think this principle is found very clearly in the Christmas story, but through the example of Joseph, Joseph the adopted dad of Jesus. If you know the story, of course, the Bible talks about it. We read a good passage over here today in Matthew chapter 1. We mentioned last week that Gabriel, uh, the angel, appeared to Mary and told her that she's going to, even though she's a virgin, she's going to give birth to a son, which is prophesied in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Mary was the prophesied one to give, as the virgin, to give birth to the Messiah, the Son of God. And so he'll be a name, he's going to be Emmanuel, all that stuff. God's with us, it's awesome. But see, at that point, she knew it, but Joseph didn't. She herself endured a lot. We talked about that through this, in a preg- her pregnancy in an age where a culture that frowned big time on sex before marriage, which is wrong and so good, but they like would stone you or at least divorce you publicly and disgrace you. Anyways, Joseph was thinking Mary cheated on him. He knew he wasn't with her. So how did she get pregnant? I mean, can you imagine? We don't know when, how, when and how he found out. It doesn't say. Uh, did Mary tell him? Don't know. Did he just see it? I don't know. But let's say Mary told him. Mary, I can't believe it looks like you're pregnant. Yeah, how do you explain that? Well, God did it. Yeah, right. Don't think so. Can't you give him a better lie than that one? And of course... The interesting thing about this, obviously, Joseph is in a lot of pain. He's hurting over it. And the wonderful thing is, it describes in Matthew chapter 1, tells us, while he, wasn't, he was hurting, no doubt, in pain over the situation, he was pondering to divorce her quietly. Now, basically, this is cool. Let's go ahead and read it together. It's Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. Joseph, to whom she was engaged was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now notice it says, first of all, that Joseph is a righteous man. From the Hebrew mindset, that meant he was faithful in obeying God's law. He was a faithful Hebrew to the law of God, the Mosaic law. Also, so that meant he had to take some action The Bible, the Old Testament, instructed that they had to take action. Old Testament talked about stoning. Uh, By his time, at least you had a divorce. And usually when they divorced, it was a public thing. It was disgrace. It was ostracism from society. It was not a good thing. Now, here's the deal. He He had to obey God's law. He had to take action. But he also still, even though he was hurting, he wasn't wanting to return the favor to Mary. And that's what's really deep to me. He was thinking she cheated on him. And and the the law mandated mandated for him to act. But even in his pain, he still didn't want to return what he thought would be a curse for a curse. People can leave us hurting. Now, thankfully, Joseph in his pain, here's the deal. it was due to a misunderstanding. But the, the neat thing is, what I want us to get a hold of, and we'll see, hurting people hurt people. And it, I think I heard that phrase for the first time like 30 years ago by Rick Warren, Saddleback Church pastor, now retired. And that, since then, I, that phrase has gone everywhere. I hear it in the world saying that phrase now, but I think it was Rick Warren. They don't know it, but he was the one that coined it. Maybe, well, he gets, from, gets the concept, from obviously, from the Lord. 
But the whole point here is this. That even though he was in pain and he wanted to lash back, and that's what we tend to want to do, he didn't. He, he honored God by trying to do what he could. He had to do, so he was going to do, I'll do a divorce, but I'll do it quietly. He's still trying to return a blessing for what he perceived to be a curse. That shows you what an awesome man he was. You can see why God would want that man to raise his son. Amen? Because yes. they both wanted to be obedient to law and he had compassion. And again, thankfully, his, his pain, though, was due to a misunderstanding of the situa- situation. Mary was still a virgin. He didn't think she was, but he was. And the baby was miraculously conceived through the Holy Spirit. God made a point of reassuring Joseph by sending an angel to him to explain the truth. You see, the enemy wanted him so caught up in his pain. And that's what the enemy does. He starts nailing our brains. Can you believe they said that? Can you believe they did that? How unthoughtful. How unkind. How mean. How whatever. What are you going to do back? Well, right? Joseph acted in a godly fashion. And so he was trying to figure out what to do. He's pondering over this. And then God intervened to reassure Joseph in the situation. He, he reassured. He gave him an, an appearance of an angel in a dream. that everything, Telling him everything was good. That this was actually God's plan. The fact is the boy was conceived through the Holy Spirit. Mary had not been with another man. God had caused her to, to get pregnant. So this is going to be the Son of God. He thought, Joseph thought he was being dishonored by his betrothed wife. In reality, the truth is, he was being honored by the God Almighty. Amen. Wow, isn't that powerful? Yes, amen. But isn't it interesting how our misunderstandings can get in there and we can misunderstand what might be a blessing, we might think it's a curse. Amen? amen. Isn't that something? But God knew that Joseph's heart and so he reassured him. He sent him an angel. Now, Joseph's problem was actually was a misunderstanding. And a lot of people's problems can be due to misunderstandings, can't they? A lot of people's mis- problems are due to their misunderstandings in life. We can make mistakes toward other people while not even trying to hurt others. I talked about that, what happened with us, with our sons, you know, faith. Other people can do the same with us. Unintentional problems can sometimes arise with others. when we, Problems can happen we just due to misunderstanding. And when unintended problems develop, the Bible's clear about what we should do. Jesus told us what we should do. When we, we should quickly try to resolve the issue by discovering what the real problem is and, and clarifying and correcting the situation. Look with me at Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. This is what Jesus said to do. So, if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple... And you suddenly remember that someone has something against you? Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Now the emphasis here is when you remember or become aware of a problem that other people might have, someone has with you. He, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, deal with it immediately. Don't put it off. When there's a problem between you and somebody else, deal with it immediately. Because the longer you wait, the more it builds up in people's brains. And that misunderstanding can even grow, can't it? Or it can can in our own minds. Deal with it immediately. Don't let time elapse at all. Put other things to the side. In this case, it was even an offering to God. Put that to the side and deal with the problem with this other person. I mean, that's deep, deep stuff Jesus is saying here. It's that important. Nothing else is as important as making, as making the thing right. That's what Jesus is saying. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Truth is, again, because some of our problems are just deal with 
come down to misunderstanding. A lot of our problems are due, due to misunderstandings. People misunderstand where thought. They think we meant this when we said this or whatever, and it was all wrong. Or maybe we did the same thing with them. <sighs> Deal with it. Do your best. It's hard to talk. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Yes, and that's why we put it off, and then it gets worse. Deal with it immediately. Nip it at the bud, as they say. It'll make a lot better in the long term. Sometimes our problems with others are due to illegitimate causes for our pain. People truly do sometimes cause us pain, don't they? People can leave us hurting. When going back to that hurting people hurt people. People, while in their pain, can irrationally lash out and hurt others through their pain. Hurting people hurt people because I'm in my pain and so I, ah, I'm not thinking lo- logically. <laughs> this week, I wasn't planning on talking about this, and it's not in my notes up there, but I do this a lot. I had a really weird experience, and I hope it was a once in a lifetime, a, a, a one, one for whatever you call it, I don't know. I, I just started like six months ago to wearing a contact. Yes, it's my left eye. If you don't know, I wear glasses. In fact, I'm wearing glasses the last several days. Anytime I'm not in the public eye, I'll wear my glasses just to give my eye a break. But, and I actually don't even really need this. But last time I went to optometrist, hey, you don't even need anything. Your right eye and your left eye, well, we'll use this kind of like a bifocal thing. Okay, so I've been doing that. And what's going on is, it was okay. I have kind of a dry eye a little bit. But one night earlier this week, Monday or Tuesday, I, I couldn't get my contact out. I didn't know, is it in? Is it out? That's a scary thought. Now, if you wear contacts, you know what I'm talking about. You're used to this. It's not a big deal. But I'm not, and I'm still kind of freaking about it. And what made it worse is I kind of touched my eye. Oh, it hurts, but it's like I haven't seen it get out. And, well, you know what? Finally, I mean, I took over an hour. And my wife started getting there. She starts doing this flashlight thing. I was like, okay, remember, I have an eyeball, and I'm kind of sensitive about it. So, you know, that kind of deal. And, and so, but she was, you know, I'm trying to pull this thing up. She found it eventually. You know what? It had folded up, and it had gotten way in the deep socket on the upper, underneath my eyelid, way up in there. Oh, okay. Is that good news or bad news? <laughs> I didn't take it goodly. <laughs> no! You know, okay, a little bit. Maybe that's a little bit extreme, but not too much. All right. Eventually, I got it out. Thank the Lord. And I didn't wear contacts for a couple days after that. You know, it's easy to let things get to us. And how we, when we get into situations that are abnormal for us or painful, we can act irrational. And so, um, it's important then, obviously Joseph, in this case, did not. And what the enemy does is he wants to get us in these painful situations, and he wants us to lash out irrationally. He wants us to act wrongly, react rather than respond to the situation, and cause greater pain with other people. That's what he does, because he uses our pain to cause pain. He's a terrible being. And the Bible talks about how we can deal with this Grinch when he attacks us, maybe through the pain of other people. When they're in pain, and we don't know their pain, but they're just causing us pain, and all we know is, ah, what's up with that? And we want to lash back, and we, a lot of pain, we're lashing back at each other, and that's not, obviously not the right thing to do. Paul, through God, through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, through Paul told us that what we should do and when when people attack us, essentially, what we, how we should fight back. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. It's saying we're actually in a spiritual war. Remember that there's actually an enemy behind it where there's a true Grinch. It says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
Now, a couple quick thoughts here. First of all, Paul's talking about spiritual warfare. Fighting demonic strongholds that are based on false human reasonings and arguments. Um, What happens a lot of times is we hear the bad thoughts. We see it. We hear the wrong thoughts from people. You know, we hear that in our society. We're hearing terrible things in our society now, aren't we? Terrible things that they're trying to push off as good that it's just evil, right? And we've talked about this. They, and what it is, is, is it's the enemy, that's what Paul is saying here, the enemy using false reasonings and arguments, attacking the knowledge of God. But what Paul says here is, he says, but our weapons are not of this world. They're divinely powerful. And so, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? One, we, we identify the true source behind it, whether it's a, something he caused or whether he's just using it. Either way, the enemy, the true Grinch, is trying to cause, trying to use these things falsely. Hey, do not think. Oh, there's so many examples of this. Do not think when you hear people, it seems like so crazy. How can you believe this? Uh, you know, for example, I was watching this on the street interview uh, a few months back when it just came out about the Roe v. Wade thing and, and this one guy interviewing this wo- young woman and saying, so, if the baby's about to be born, is it okay to kill it? My body, my choice was his response. Well, what about when the baby's coming out? My body, my choice. What about after the baby comes out? My body, my choice. What about when the baby's two years old? My body, my choice. What about when the, ba- the child's now nine years old? My body, my choice. Over and over and over and over again. Blind. False human reasonings. Amen? That's not your body. First of all, it's never your body. Amen? That's an child in your womb whether you would acknowledge it or not. Amen? And it's obvious another person when they come out. Amen? But when you're so duped, that's, a, that's what the enemy is. There's no way they could be that blind without the influence of the enemy. And so we need to address it. We attack the enemy who uses this stuff. The devil. We use spiritual warfare prayer. In the, name of, in the name of Jesus, I come against it. To break down, and you break down the strongholds. And then you try, by the word of God in truth, to show the truth of it. By trusting in Him, God, to work through you. So that's what the enemy does. But we need to respond way. Now, also, we need to remember that when, when people, if they can leave us hurting, our natu- God is reassuring. God wants to reassure us, reassure us in our pain. He did that With Joseph, right? He cared so much about... Joseph was doing it right. He was even going to try to be a blessing to Mary who he thought was being a curse to him. And so so God was so moved by Joseph, not to mention, of course, it's his own son involved here, Jesus. But God sent his son, I mean, sent an angel to uh, reassure Joseph. Now, it's important that when we encounter hard times that we don't lash back out in retribution, that we still show forgiveness and patience toward other people. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. Don't repay, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate when insults, with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is Joseph here, isn't it? I mean, not the divorce is a blessing, but he was trying to do it in the nicest way. That's what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Notice it says not to retaliate evil for evil, but to return a blessing instead. And when we do that, God is going to grant us a blessing. That's a promise. We need to claim it. Well, that's great, but how do we do that? 
How do we properly act in a situation when we're hurting so much? We might know that I'm supposed to forgive, okay, and I should return a blessing for cursing, but everything inside me says something the opposite. How do I deal with that? How do we experience God's reassurance and joy when we're hurting and handle it right? Well, these are important, legitimate questions, and I think the answer can be found through how Joseph responded to the situation. So let's look at that. How do I find reassurance and joy in my hurt? Let's look at Joseph. First, what we should do, when I, if I want to find reassurance and joy in my pain, other people said something wrong to me, okay, there's some things we can say from this. First of all, choose to be better, not bitter. Choose to get better, not bitter. I did not coin this phrase, but I love this phrase. Choose to be better, not bitter. You see, we're tempted to get bitter. Amen? Every time someone says something wrong to us, we want to get bitter over it. We want to get resentful. We want to even do something wrong toward them back. Right? We want to cause pain. They cause me pain. I want to go back. Fight. You know, when you encounter hard times, it's fight or flight. We either want to fight or we want to flight. Either way, it's not good. We want to get bitter. But yet, Joseph was a godly man and he chose to get better. Look at Matthew 119. Joseph did not want to disgrace her publicly. Even though he thought she was doing that to him. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. I mean, that's cool stuff. Amen? Even while he was hurting, he elected to choose the high road and seek not to re- do retribution against Mary. Even in his pain, he chose to honor God and get better, not bitter. Now, that's, we know it's good to do, but it's not easy to do. That's hard. The key is, see, here's the truth is, two people can be in the exact same situation and have the exact same thing happen to them. But one, very opposite things can happen through their response. One person can choose to do it right and actually be better from it and have a life, positive direct trajectory in their life. And other people gets bitter and they just go off. It's all how we... The problem then, I want you to hear this. The problem isn't the problem. The problem is how I react to the problem. Mm, You want me to say that again? The problem isn't the problem. The problem is how I react to the problem. Reminds me of the character Miss Havisham in in the book Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Uh, She was uh, spurned at the wedding altar and she was determined after that to never go beyond that moment. Her groom-to-be left her at there and she made all her clocks stop and stayed that way for years, decades. At the same time, the moment he left left her at the altar. She still wore the old wedding dress now, tattered. Wore one shoe, I forget why the other one was off. And she was also was bitter to the core because of what was done to her. And she was determined to cause pain in others because she was in so, so much pain. And she did that to the main character named Pip. And did the, basically ended up doing the same thing to him that was done to her through her granddaughter. And it was only when she realized, wait a minute, I'm causing the same, I'm becoming the very thing that caused me pain. And that realization was the only thing that changed her. But unfortunately, you see, bitter people can begin to become destructive people. Better people, on the other hand, become affirming, affirming and encouraging people. And God uses them to actually help others in their pain. Do you want to be a better person or a bitter person? You cannot be both. Well, how do we become better and not bitter then? How? Because it sounds easier said than done, doesn't it? Right? Come on, doesn't it? So how do we get better and not bitter? One, here's the next thing. Look for God's reassurance by dwelling in his presence. This is important. Look for God's reassurance by dwelling in his presence. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Joseph, son of, da- son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. This was happening as Joseph was reasoning and praying in his own heart about what he should do. And he was trying to do, trying to be obedient to the law, so he had to deal with it, but also trying to be as kind and as compassionate to Mary, even though she felt, he felt like she was hurting him. 
God sent his angel to reassure Joseph because Joseph had already decided to honor God through his actions and his compassion toward Mary. And because Joseph, by choosing to be better instead of bitter, God motivated him and reassured him by sending an angel. Here's the point. Go to God before you lash out and do something to other people. And stay there in God's presence until God helps you. Now, of course, here's the deal. Yes, God had a promise for concerning the Messiah, but he has promises for us too. God will reassure us the same way he reassured Joseph if we do it right. Right now, I want us to look in God's word to show how he speaks to us. I want you to hear that God's for you like he was for Joseph in the situation. Look at me at Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 34. What shall we say then about such wonderful things as these? It's talking about God being for us. If God is for us, there it is. Who can ever be against us? The answer is no one. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Answer, yes. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Answer, no one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Well, who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is seated in a, and he is seating, sitting in a place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. There is so much more to these verses we can say and, and it's a shame to just kind of approach it and not go into it, but we can't. The key point here is God is for you and so therefore no one, no other people... Not even, and not even the devil, because he goes on and says that, no, not hell itself can separate you from God's love. It goes on about nothing can separate you from God being for you and all that he is for you and, that what you, and your promise is secure in him. Here's the deal. Even if the devil is accusing you, which he does do, and he's going to try to condemn you. Don't listen to that. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. If you know Jesus Christ, you're his. If you are chosen and you're defended by him, he's got your back. That's what this is saying. My friend, be assured, reassured. He's got you. Whatever you're going through, he's got you. Whatever you go through. He knows what's going on with the problem, people. And you feel like, Lord, you're up there. I can't feel you. You're, not, you're like intangible. You're out there. But God, and these people are real. And do you hear what they're saying? Yes, I do. And I got you. But Lord, it keeps on going on. I got you. And by the way, find the reassurances by claiming the promise of God like we just saw in Romans 8 there. That's a, he's got your back. And, and, and we get reassurance by dwelling in his presence. Look with me at Psalm 16, verse 11. Talking to God, David says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Where's the joy found? In the presence of God. Choose to enter God's presence and don't leave it until reassurance, peace, and joy come. And then dwell there. Lastly, I can experience God's reassurance through trusting and obeying God's direction. This is what Joseph did. Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. God, through the angel, commanded Joseph to do two things. One, take Mary as his wife, and two, name the boy Jesus. And he went and immediately did. He did the first immediately. He married her. And then when the child was born, he named him Jesus. He obeyed God thoroughly, and he had the joy because of it. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Joseph trusted and obeyed. And therefore, he got the blessings of obedience. People can leave us hurting, but God is reassuring. Let's choose when people hurt us to become the better people, not the bitter people. Let's choose to work it out with them if at all possible. Let's choose God's presence for our reassurance and trust and obey Him when He directs us. 
D.L. Moody once said, Joy flows right on through trouble. Joy flows on through the dark. Joy flows in the night as well as in the day. Joy flows all through persecution and opposition. It's an unceasing fountain bubbling up in the heart, a secret spring the world can't see and doesn't know about anything about. The Lord gives his people perpetual joy when they walk in obedience to him. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We're going to have prayer time now. What's the Lord speaking to you today about? There is a real devil, or a true Grinch, and his desire is to make you miserable. Maybe you've been miserable. He really seems to really have at it during Christmas season. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? I have. How's he been trying to make you miserable this Christmas season? How's he been trying to steal your joy? He's trying to steal mine. You know? Thankfully, I've been studying this, so I try to remind myself of what I'm sharing with you all. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Practice what I... I'm trying anyways. But it's not always easy, is it? So what do you need to do to experience joy today? Let me just ask you a few questions and then we'll pray. Someone's hurt you or a situation's hurting you. Or have you been choosing to be better or bitter? If you chose bitter, your joy has been taken from you. But you can take it back. Choose to be better. Repent and choose to be better. Two, maybe someone's been hurting you, but you've just been languishing in pain. And you haven't been going to the Lord, His presence, to find the joy and the peace where it's found. So I encourage you to do that. Three, maybe you know what He wants you to do, you just haven't done it yet. You haven't trusted Him in His promises. And so you haven't claimed the joy and the peace that comes with it. Whatever it is, why don't you seek the Lord and make that commitment to Him right now. Let's pray. Father God, you're such an awesome God. Thank you, Lord. Your word is truth. And it's sometimes difficult. But it's true. And I thank you, Lord, that we're not alone in this thing. While people can leave us hurting, Lord, you're reassuring. You're there for us in the battle. We just need to go to you for it. Father, I want to pray for every one of us today. Lord, if they've been feel hurting in the battle, maybe. Lord, maybe that they're experiencing pain in some way. If they've been hurt from others or other things. Lord, it's so hard, especially when we get hurt from people. Especially if they're loved ones. That cuts deep. Sure, how Joseph felt. But Lord, you're still reassuring in the battle. And you're our healer. And you're our guide. And when we go to you, we find direction. We find that peace. We find the healing. We find the joy that we need. Lord, I pray for every one of us today, God. Whatever we're going through. In our pain, you're there. And you want to reassure us. Lord, there's some people right now, I'm just guessing... They feel pain right now, but they don't know what to do. How to get your reassurance. I pray, Lord, that they would choose to believe the truth that you're there for them. And that they will choose your presence.
and choose to be better, not bitter. Choose not to return evil for evil, but to return a blessing instead. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would get, make them a better person and heal them and resolve the situation. Bless them right now, Lord. And friend, whatever it is, Lord, to tell the Lord whatever it is that you're dealing with, Say, say, Lord, I, I want to be better, not bitter. Forgive me, Lord, when I let my pride get in the way, maybe, and I, and I just hold on to it. Forgive me, God, for that. Lord, I want to do it right. I want to honor you. Lord God, I, I want to find peace and strength and, pe- and, and joy in your presence. Help me to seek you out first before I do anything else and Lord when you tell me what to do whether it's through your word or other things I want to obey it and find the joy of obedience in Christ as I trust you in your word Lord I pray that for every person here today I pray for those who are online watching this today God may we apply your word and find the joy that it brings, that you bring through it. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.